Hello and welcome to another edition of Nucleus Investment Insights. Uh, we have Leith here today to, to run through the uh, is Australian, oh sorry, it was saying Australia is in a per capita recession and has been for some time and, and the big question, does it, does it matter? And so uh, we're going to run through some of the charts, have a, have a bit of a, a deeper look. Uh, before we get into that, just a quick reminder that um, uh, to hit the, the uh, like and subscribe buttons, and uh, everything you hear today, none of it is personal advice. If you do want personal advice, uh, give us a call, book in for a meeting. Um, every, everything we're talking about is, is general investment advice. Uh, you know, with that uh, out of the way, I will leap straight into Leith and say, you know, uh, we had the results yesterday, uh, sorry, GDP out yesterday. What were your thoughts, uh, big picture, and, um, and then we'll get into some of the detail. Yeah, thanks, Damien, and uh, hello, everyone. Uh, yeah, look, so on Wednesday, the Australian Bureau of Statistics released the Q4 National Accounts for Australia. So that's basically where you get your GDP numbers and all, all the main economic data. Now, um, it is obviously backward looking. So this is for the December quarter. We're obviously in March, so it's almost a quarter behind. Uh, but what it did show is that the Australian economy is incredibly weak. So if you look at the overall economic pie, Australia's GDP grew by 0.2% over the quarter and one point. Uh, 5% over the year. Now, that was slightly weaker than what economists' expectations were. So economists were tipping about 0.3% growth. It's also marginally, only slightly, below what the Reserve Bank's projections were for the quarter. Now, they also tipped 0.3%. Um, so the economy is a little bit softer than what, than what they were tipping. Now, the bigger thing here is the actual contributions to growth. So the thing that drove Australia's growth over the December quarter was uh, net exports. So basically what happened was we had a massive fall in in import volumes over the quarter, they fell by uh, about three and a half percent, and that actually contributed about 0.7 percent to Australia's growth. And that that basically is a reflection of weak demand in the economy. We imported less; there was a big destock of inventories and things like that. Um, but the thing that the the most important aspect to look for is that the household sector. So the household sector comprises nearly 60 percent of the growth, and that's basically what most people care about because we're all households, right? Um, you know, we 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 live in that world. Um, household consumption only only grew by 0.1 percent uh, uh, in the in the quarter, and um, it's incredibly weak and actually fell in in uh, per capita terms. Sorry, 0.1 percent over the year for 2023. And once you adjust for population growth, uh, household spending actually actually fell by 2.4 uh, percent. So, uh, which was weaker than the fall in per capita GDP growth of one percent. Yep. Now these are real numbers as well, aren't they? That's right. So, inflation adjusted. Yeah, inflation adjusted. So um three ish percent inflation, depending upon what your your thing is. So so yeah, so vol volumes, um volume's very weak and um and absolute prices, yeah, slight, slightly up. Yeah, and, and, and the key thing to think is so so I, I, over the year, um the economy grew by one one point five one point five percent, but the population grew by two point six percent almost. So we, it's a, it's another case that we had a basically a third straight quarter of per capita recession, whereby the overall economic pie grew, but everyone sliced the pie shrink, um, and and that's basically been the story for you know a while now. But the bigger thing, and this is the uh, the thing that's probably going to matter more for the Reserve Bank of Australia, is the consumption. So the household consumption fell, as I said, by uh, nearly two and a half percent last year, which is a you know th that's a big decline. And it's actually a lot worse than what the uh, what, what the Reserve Bank had tipped. So um, in the in the November statement of monetary policy, the Reserve Bank had tipped that household consumption would be one point one percent in Q four, and then it revised that down last month in the, in the February statement of monetary policy, tipped point four percent. Instead, we only got zero point one percent. That's obviously before adjusting for population growth. So, you know, what that tells you is that. And I think this will actually surprise the RBA. The household sector consumer spending is a lot worse than what the Reserve Bank had expected, even as early as last month. And that, to me, is just another sign. We've basically had all these economic indicators come out that have been worse than what the Reserve Bank expected. So, you know, inflation has been lower. The unemployment rate's rising faster than they expected. Retail sales have been worse. And then now we've obviously got, uh, you know, um, GD, overall GDP was marginally worse than they expected, but the household sector was a lot worse 
than what the Reserve Bank had expected. And, and this basically just plays into the whole theme that we've been running on macro business for a long time, that the Reserve Bank is going to cut rates in the second half of this year. Yeah. And, uh, so, I mean, it's, it's interesting. We've, we've posited with Dave a few times um, this idea that, uh, you know, Australia came out lagging the rest of the world because... Um, uh, because we, our lockdowns lasted longer, and so um, you know we were sort of behind the cycle, but that it maybe looks like we've caught up, and and particularly in the case of the US, um, you know, I guess that we're now beating them on the way down by the look of it. Yeah, and in some ways, some ways we're actually ahead in, in, in certain ways. Like, so we're obviously a bit later to start raising rates, but we've also got a lot more um, quicker transmission in our monetary policy because we have such a high share of verbal rate mortgages and very short term fixed rates, which are all pretty much expired now. Um, you know, the, the Reserve Bank's obviously hiked rates by 4.25%, which is, say, less than, say, New Zealand, which did 525 But we have a much uh, quicker transmission to in our monetary policy. So when the RBA hikes rates, it flows through to the household sector very quickly because most of us are on variable rate mortgages. Now, if you want to look at the other extreme to that, the United States, um, you know, most of them are on, uh, you know, these, these sort of 25-year or 30-year fixed rate mortgages. Mm. So, well, so, so the the federal the federal reserves hiked rates, but it hasn't really flowed onto the uh, households to nearly the same degree as Australia. So, yeah. in some so, ways, so it's new new a, houses, well, people who are transacting houses, but new yeah, it's new yeah. home buyers straight away in the US, and but but uh, Australia takes the it overall, to, yeah. yeah, 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 and and look, look, you know, Australia does have a different sort of inflation problem. Like a lot of ours is, I'd argue it's it's homegrown. So you know, obviously running very high immigration at the moment, that's pushed up rents and housing inflation, and also we've obviously totally messed up energy policy. So, um, but at the same time, our wage growth is a lot weaker than elsewhere, would you believe? So despite all this talk of, you know, Australia's wages going up and we're going to have a wage breakout, our wage growth actually lagged the rest of the world. Yeah. So we do have different different circumstances here a little bit. And, and so that's, I mean, that's worth digging into because, I mean, the, the worry in the US for policymakers there is that you've got wages growth, um, that's going to flow into services inflation, which then cycles back into wages growth, and, and you've got that sort of ever ever rising cycle. We don't have that here, so no. I guess the question is: um, it, it would seem to me, for, as a sort of uh, you know, as a, as an interested investor, is that you know you look at you look at Australia, and as you said, it's homegrown in terms of a lot of its uh, house prices, which is sort of driven by this extreme and population and rents. Yep. Um, uh, yeah, so rents is probably the bigger one in there, isn't it? And yeah. um, and, and as you said, the energy policy we're playing that higher than what we thought. Uh, and there's obviously then this sort of crush loading idea that you know it's not just rents. There's, there'll be other things as well that's that are sort of um, capacity constrained in terms of having people, lots more people. So um, and then the flip side, because we've got so many people, the wage growth is really weak. So you're not going to get that same sort of you're not going to get that same cycle. But raising interest rates isn't going to solve energy. Because it's it's a world to global price doesn't really matter what what's happening in Australia. It's not going to save solve houses. It's probably actually going to make things worse. You'd think because fewer people will build houses if with with higher interest rates, and um, uh, and it's not fixing the wage growth problem. So you know it's sort of it's almost the wrong. Whereas you can see in the US, it's there's an argument to keep the keep them higher to to keep wage growth down. It's not necessary in Australia, and and raising rates isn't fixing any of the any of the main sources of our inflation. Yeah, and also, look, I'd argue that you know that the the U.S. economy is a lot stronger than ours. So, U.S. economy is actually going through a growth phase compared to you know us and Canada and New Zealand and even the U.K. Like we're all having quite strong per capita recessions mm. at the moment, and some of them outright recessions. Whereas the the U.S. has actually got got some decent growth in comparison. Um, so, you know, we 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 do have different circumstances, but it, but even then, uh, I, I think even with these uh, homegrown inflation pressures, um, we're going to get rate cuts in the second half of the year. And the, and the main, I, I'd argue the main uh, data point to look at, Damien, is actually the unemployment rate. So the February statement of mon monetary policy um, projections from the Reserve Bank projected that by the end of this year, Australia's unemployment rate would only hit 4.3%. And uh, we're already at 4.1%. So with that, that, that's as of January with 11 months to go to hit that. And basically, I think the Reserve Bank was very, you know, way too bullish are way too optimistic in their unemployment rate forecast and because pretty much every single leading indicator is showing that unemployment is going to rise. So if you're looking at, uh, you know, the SEEK number of applicants per job ads, and there's a whole bunch of other ones suggest that the unemployment rate is going to rise. Also, unemployment is a, a lagging indicator. So with the economy this week, especially in the household sector and domestic demand, 
Um, it's only a matter of time before unemployment ratchets higher. And it'll, you know, I honestly think in the next few months, we're already going to hit the Reserve Bank's uh, unemployment rate forecast that they had for December 31. Um, we're going to hit that in the next couple of months. And when we do breach that, um, that'll obviously, you know, uh, set the set set the course for a pivot on interest rates, and then you know rate cuts in the second half. So that's that's kind of my thinking there. Yeah. So and so, um, given one of the things that's interesting to me uh, from a company perspective, sort of looking at, the, at sort of this bottom up, and and how do we how do we how do we sort of analyze what's going on? Is that um, uh, if you look at grocery prices, which is sort of in one of your charts, there is still relatively high in terms of that food cost. So the, the underlying food cost to um, the money that's going to farmers is pretty low. Like there's, there hasn't been inflation there and, and arguably there's, you know, there's deflation in various various components of that. Um, there's uh, the margins are, are reasonable for supermarkets. They're, they're, they're not, um, well, they've certainly gone up more than you expect, but they're not like, um, they're not like far and away um, booming. And it seems to be because to, to me, sort of analysing the company, it seems to be because it's all the way down. Everyone's just taking a little bit more all the way down the supply chain, uh, all the way up and down the supply chain. And I guess the question is on these, um, you know, we'd, we'd like capitalism to kick, kick in at some time and, and, and in, in the sectors where there is lots of um, competition, uh, you know, transport's a good example or, or uh, you know, things like cars and, and tires and, you know, all that type of stuff where we saw prices go up and now prices are, are, are genuinely declining. It doesn't seem to be happening in that food part. So even though the, I guess the farmer's prices shot up and then the farmer's prices came back down again, um, but it all got pushed through to the, the supermarkets and that hasn't come down. Uh, I guess from a, from an economic, from a from a, a macro perspective, I'd be interested in your thoughts in terms of this, whether you can see that, um, or whether there's any sort of macro stats in terms of uh, the pressures that that uh, Australia versus other countries. I guess I guess what I'm trying to come to is, just capital. Which, which sectors should we be worried about capitalism kicking in, and is it that because Coles and Woolies make up such a large market share, that that's one place where it might not come actually come through. Yeah, look, I mean, there, there, there's, there's, I guess, two angles to that. So the first one is, um, you know, pretty much anything that comes in off a container ship is coming down in price. So we're sort of getting, uh, you know, disinflation or de outright deflation on those sorts of things. Hmm. So, you know, we're talking about your, your consumer items, et cetera, your TVs, your, you know, washing machines, anything that's manufactured. China's basically, uh, you know, exporting deflation now. And, and, that's, and that's helping to push down goods inflation and that's helping to obviously lower, uh, you know, overall inflation. Um, the pressure points is more this, yeah, this domestic stuff you talk about. And Australia does obviously have a very concentrated marketplace, not just in, in supermarkets, but we do have a lot of embedded inflation across the board. And, you know, a classic, classic example here is, uh, for example, you know, toll roads, right? So we've got, we've got a litany of toll roads built around the country now, most of them are by Transurban. Yeah. All, all their contracts now have basically got um, embedded, you know, CPI plus, Toll, toll hike. So yeah. whenever inflation goes up, it automatically gets passed on in higher toll roads. Yep. They can pass it on four times a year, and then you that then sort of gets this second round inflation and, impact. And you don't even see it anymore. But like you, no. in the old days when you used to have to shell out the coins to put it in, you were like, oh, they just raised it. Whereas now you don't even notice. This no, and it's four times, times a year. Yeah. But, but you know, we, yeah. we have that pretty much across the economy in so many different areas. Yeah. Like, you know, it doesn't matter if it's you know, well, insurance or uh, whatever. And and and. Uh, and disclaimer, you know, we own Transurban in our portfolio for exactly oh, that reason. As we should, they are the uh, they are the masters, as, as I've always said, of going to governments and saying, you know, if if Leith is a, the the premier of a state, I'll turn up to Leith and say, hey, Leith, I've got this deal for you. It's going to be a crappy deal over the next fifty years, but it's going to be fantastic until the next election. Would you like? Yep, that? and it's going to be it's going to look great <laughs> on the budget because you can hold it off balance sheet. You're exactly. not going to have greater government debt. So, but yeah, goes, so oh, at the next election, fantastic. That's all that I yeah. care about. I don't care about the next and, fifty years. Yeah. And I'm obviously picking on trans urban, but this is across the economy, right? So, yeah. so we're basically saying, you know, a massive sway of the privatisations for this is a philosophical discussion. We'd have a bigger one later, but yeah. or another time. But basically, we've we privatised everything to a certain degree. We've also you know, sort of contracted out things that used to be done by government to these private players. Mm. And uh, and now we basically have, I call them sort of private taxes. So your toll road payments, et cetera, are kind of like a private tax, right? Yep. 
Um, and 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 a lot of those are linked to inflation. So mm. if you have a so we've had this kind of um, you know initially the the inflation spike was caused by supply constraints internationally. Um, you know obviously stimulus pushed up demand. Uh, we had supply bottlenecks everywhere. Shipping lanes shut, factories closed down temporarily because of the pandemic and the virus, etc. And that pushed up everything. And then but then that inflation shock then filters into all these other areas like toll roads, pricing, and a whole bunch of stuff. Mm. Um, and then that just sort of embeds this inflation. So, um, yeah, I, I assume with the, you know, what's going on with supermarkets is a bit of that at play, um, you know, with, with you know, with with uh, sort of more fresh food and et cetera. Although I have, I, I do notice that um, at least on my shops, a lot of the goods that rocket in price. So, for example, I buy this Greek yogurt every, you know, every week, Damien, mm. and it went from $8.50 or $7.50 before the pandemic to $8.50. And then we had the inflation spike, it went to $12.50. Now it's actually come back to ten fifty, right. and I've noticed that in a whole bunch of goods. So I think yeah. I think there has been some but, moderation but, there, but, and that's a classic one though as well. I, I was thinking exactly the same thing in, in terms of yogurt. Is like you know, yep. is that the milk price is you know, rock went up for a bit, but it's back. So farmers aren't making any more from that. No, is there any more in the and, production? And, and, Maybe and a little still, bit. There's no more in the transport. It's not a yeah. Not yeah, it sort of goes up fifty percent, then it goes up fifty percent, and pulls back fifteen. You know yeah. what I mean? Uh, yeah, we're sort of seeing that across across the spectrum. I think yeah. On, uh, <laughs> on yeah, on our shops. Um, you know, can we do anything about it? Probably not. Yeah. Uh, and but well, I'm sort of and, I'm and sort of banking on the this inflation. That, that comes back to the ACCC decision the other day with uh, uh, Suncorp. Suncorp, doesn't it? Is the ACCC decided? No, this is this is uncompetitive. We've got a concentrated banking market. We don't need any more concentration. And and then overturned by judges yeah that's it well yeah. that's it so so the ACCC has got a couple hundred people who you know who, who, who did this analysis and wrote this report and came up with this decision and then you had 10 people on the uh competition appeals tribunal overturn it so mm -hmm. you know which which then just sends the signal sends a bad precedent for starters like if you're any of the other big players banks you might as well take over a mid-tier bank because you know you've got a precedent now to do it yes but also it also tells the ACCC you know don't do your job um yeah, so, yeah, yeah, not yeah, right. yeah, that's right. Well, and and we've already got enough problems with um, you know, relationships between uh, the uh, regulators and and the the people who are being regulated. Like you know, we've we've already identified that for um, you know, the whole banking half the banking royal commission was was about that, wasn't it? That that we've just got too cozy of a relationship between regulators and and then so the first time the regulator says well, not the first time, but you know. There's been a few times that they've been the, the regulators have stepped up and gone, oh, okay, going to try and find Westpac a whole bunch of money, and the courts went, no, you're not. And then they're standing up, going, oh, we're going to stand in the way of competition, and courts are like, no, you're not, and saying, well, yes, it's a, um, yeah, we're not, we're not helping ourselves. So, so I mean, and that's, I guess, that's an argument for structurally higher inflation, um, yeah, generally. But then the question comes back to. Um, if we're if there's no way if there's no per capita if we're in a per capita recession and and so we're going to be at you know I think we're back to 2018 levels are we now? Or, uh, yeah, so 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 um, the the per capita we're, we're basically I think back to roughly um, sort of pre pre COVID levels I guess of growth. Mm. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, or consumption consumption at least we're back to sort of 2018 levels for household consumption. Yeah, uh, we, 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 which is the thing. Look, let's face it. That's the thing that you know Australians should care about because we live in the household sector. We don't, we're not an exporter. We're not a, you know, we're not government business, etc. Like, yeah, that's right. When households is what we care our about. Price, price doubles. Your your household budget doesn't go up by ten percent. That's it. That's yeah. right. So 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 in terms of you know, and, and we've obviously had we obviously living standards have been smashed. So I don't. I haven't quite calculated the data yet. I'll do that uh, tonight once I get the Reserve Bank spreadsheet. They they always do a spreadsheet two days after national counts come out on. Um, on household disposable income, and then I deflate it by per capita. So it's uh, like it's a you know it's the way I calculate that. And as of the September quarter, we experienced like a six percent uh, annual decline in um, real per capita household disposable incomes. Now I think it actually rebounded marginally in Q4 because uh, for some reason, in the quirk in the statistics, we had less income tax paid. Um, but even so, Australian households have experienced one of the biggest declines in per capita household disposable income in history and one of the worst in the world. And it's just another, you know, sign here that uh, the household sector has been smashed. And that's really what the, I think the Reserve Bank should be concentrating on, like not, not net exports, et cetera. Um, you know, I think they'll be looking at the household sector first and foremost, because that's the thing that's obviously impacted most by 
interest rates and it's also you know most telling for the labor market etc yeah now we are about to get some tax cuts um so i guess the question for that that was partly i guess the 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 um the, the title for the slide you know does, does it matter we're in a per capita recession or not uh was, was sort of around this idea that look um you if if, if we've got very weak income growth and but we're actually just we're, we're going to top up everyone's salaries with a um uh, sorry very weak income growth and we've got this inflation that hasn't really come back so companies are making um, more money than than perhaps they might if if we had a stronger competition um and but but then we sort of juice it by a a, a tax cut does that then lead to sort of a uh i guess it uh, that sort of lifts the glide path so that uh things don't look as as bad for for the whole of 2024 yeah, at, at, at the margin it does, uh, but at the same time, um, you know, so so the CBA economics team did some great analysis on on the stage three tax cuts, and then yeah. they did some projections. And so basically, in the year to September, so I'm not sure what it is in the year to December yet, but in the year to September, basically income tax payments went up by about twenty two and a half percent, whereas overall wages and salaries went up seven and a half percent. So basically, we had this massive rising bracket creep, which pulled everyone into higher t- average tax brackets. Yep, and we had a chat we, on one of these charts you had there. Yeah, in fact, it's it's the bottom right chart on the uh, on the second last slide. There's a chart yep. here from Justin Farbo at Antipodean Macro, and you can see that blue line there shows uh, income tax payments, mm-hmm. and you can see they rose significantly in, in the September, and then they dipped a little bit in, in the December quarter. But yeah, so for basically, anyone, anyone listening in, um, so the income tax payments went from sort of, you know, 2010, they were back at sort of 14. percent They've been rising. Relatively steadily since then, up to oh uh, yeah, as a percentage of disposable income, up to sort of eighteen percent, and then we've spiked, spiked up to twenty two percent, and then now it's falling back. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, slightly. It's just fallen. Oh, it's just yeah. retraced a little bit in the in the December quarter. So anyway, but but CBA did some analysis, and they said that basically in a year's time, up a year after the um, the stage three tax cuts come in, we're still going to be paying a higher share of our disposable income in taxes than we did before the stage three tax cuts. So basically, another. So we're going to give back some bracket creep, but then they're going to take back the bracket creep through further bracket creep. Yeah. Um, and we're going to basically be, be spending a record share of our disposable income on taxes a year after the stage three tax cuts come in. So, yeah, look, look, it's it, it's a temporary reprieve. It's pretty small beer, I think, in the you know in the overall um, you know size of the economy. And then the government will get some of it back anyway when we get higher bracket creep. Um, so you know. It's certainly not a policy whereby they're going to index the the tax scales to inflation or something. It's just, it's just a one-off. You yeah, know, give a little bit of it back after it's gone up heaps. Yeah, yeah. but then we'll take it back through yeah. more bracket credit. And you know, as uh, you know, as a, as a as a sort of a an armchair economist as well, I sort of that doesn't really bother me as much as saying you've actually got negative. You sort of like you've set the system to negative drift in terms of saying, yeah, okay, we're going to take more tax over time. And then if things are going well, we can tax cuts. But if things are going badly, then you know, then we've actually got the more money without having to raise without having to raise taxes explicitly. Yeah. So, well, it, so, certainly in the short term, I agree with you. But I think I think we've got a longer term issue in that the tax system is way too heavily reliant on personal income tax. But that, that's another yes. topic for another day. And, and and we need you know wide broad broad based tax reform. But mm. yeah, certainly get your point. But but yeah. but but that that's a it, it, I think. If you take so like, 10, 10 year horizon, it's it's a recipe for problems. Yeah, but 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 I guess I mean that it's, that does come back to these points we're talking about. Though saying in terms of saying the um, we think the competition setting isn't particularly good for Australia. We think the productivity is not set, set up well because and I think um, how did uh, Jared Minak described it well. I'm trying to remember what it was. Capital, it's basically capital you, can, you can either yeah you can either add more capital, make your 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 economy more productive, or you can throw more people at the problem and and make everyone less productive, every individual which less is, productive, which is exactly which. What we're which doing. to yeah. be quite frank, that's been Australia's policy the last twenty years. So basically, we've what what, what Jerry Minnick was saying, and and, to, and and Dave and I have been saying it for ages as well. Hmm. That's, that's uh, it, reason, reason for the start of Macro Business website, just about. Yeah, pretty much, pretty much. Is so. So yeah. basically, we're, we're, we've been growing the economy through people mm. a lot faster than we've grown business investment, uh, infrastructure, and and also housing. And what that basically does is it le- means you got less capital. So not in the accounting sense with money. We're talking about you know capital stock, so mm. machinery, equipment, etc. Um, per worker, and then that's basically led to lower productivity growth. And that's Australia's basically caught in um, you know a bit of a population trap. And so is Canada. So, so Canada and Australia are running the same sort of system and we've got exactly the same problems. We're basically growing the population far quicker than 
we're growing, you know, business yeah. investment well, and, infrastructure. And I'd though argue as well that at least Canada has a bit of a history of of manufacturing and yeah, um, and it's and close to the right US. Next, so sitting right next to the US, exactly. That they can, you know, the car companies can can easily, you know, manufacture parts in Canada and not really care that yeah, okay, it's international, but actually it's it's probably closer to, for a lot of the car companies to to in Detroit to manufacture stuff in Canada than it is say, in to manufacture yeah. in California. So yeah, it is, and, and in fact, you know, there, there are car companies in Windsor, Ontario, which is just across the lake from um, from from Michigan. So yeah, um, yeah, yeah you know, exactly. where, whereas we obviously don't have that uh, that, no. that luxury being a being a uh, you no, know an island nation miles from anywhere. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, so sorry, where where I was going with this though was so we're saying we've got um, so we've set ourselves uh, you know a competition policy that doesn't seem to be well, it seems to be suboptimal. We've set ourselves a, a people problem that seems to be suboptimal. You've, you've just spoken about we've got problems in terms of the tax system um, is, is becoming more and more um, problematic in terms of needs restructuring. And there's no political will to fix any of these issues, it looks like. And so um, I, I guess that sort of leads me back to this thought that, well, if I'm investing in Australia, what I really need to do is is make sure that I'm I'm investing in companies that benefit from the 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 population Ponzi and the squeeze, Ponzi. and so the Transurban, for example, is that type of Classic. company where you're like, yep, you know, they've already got the toll roads. There's going to be more people jam packed in Sydney, Melbourne, Brisbane, wherever, and so therefore, uh, and they've got the, as you said, you know, most utilities um, have inflation minus. Like it's like, yeah, okay, you can you can have the inflation rate minus two percent or inflation rate minus one and a half percent. That's what you're allowed to raise your prices at. Whereas in Transurban's managed to, to, to get inflation plus. So yeah. Yeah, yeah inflation or inflation plus, depending on, on, on the contract. There's about yeah. twenty of them. Yeah. But so and 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 it doesn't look like that's changing anytime soon. Um, you could make an argument that say that's a that's a reason to invest in the banks a bit more. Yeah. Um, that one always hurts me because uh, you know I think Australian banks, from a from an investment point of view, they are some of the most profitable banks in the world, um, uh, and they're also the most expensive banks in the world, <laughs> particularly CBA. And the question comes back to saying, well, is that just because we've got a cl they've got a, the closest relationship with the regulators, um, closer than, than anywhere else, and and that's that's highly potential. So you know, I guess the the, the question, yeah, it, it seems to me that the answer from from what you're saying still seems to be keep investing in people who are, um, who who are tied to the old economy as inefficient yep. as it might be, um, and um, yeah. the oligopoly economy, the oligopoly economy, exactly. And and you know, so 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 you know, we we, we keep saying transurban, not just them being able to increase their toll prices, but also their the number of people who drive on their roads just it gets increased by basically mm. population growth every year. So it's you know, yeah. it's a and it's the same with you know uh, any of the big retailers, um, the banks, etc. The, the customer base is forever expanding through the power yeah. of people. Yeah, and so it just basically creates a tailwind. Yeah, and and then that's and then the the flips the other side of your portfolio though is saying there's there's probably a structural reason to be overweight international as well with that same argument of saying you know low productivity and all that type of stuff. Sure, you can have some companies that benefit at the margin, but if you're if you set up as, as a low productivity economy and, and no imminent signs of any change there. Then, um, uh, yeah, then international is is sort of makes makes a lot more sense. Um, that sort of brings us to the question of the week, and then I'll I'll come back to you, Leith, for a um, uh, for for some thoughts. But you know, the question I really wanted to pose because this is this has happened on, a, on numerous occasions. We've we've had bad policy settings, but you know, they call Australia the lucky country because. Um, uh, second rate politicians run by second rate politicians who share in its luck. And uh, Australia does have a, um, a a a penchant for you know things happening that that are, that are very beneficial to it. So um, yeah, for example, the the rise of China was extremely beneficial for for, for Australia. You know, avoiding recession during um, the financial crisis. Uh, you know, we had the uh, the good sense to to have lots of iron ore and to be closer to the China than than Brazil. I think is uh, it's been described. And um, uh, you know, then again, you know, as as iron ore prices were crashing, sort of in um, 2015-16, uh, huge some huge mining disasters in Brazil, which then pushed the price back up again, and and sort of gave uh, Australia another an, another push there. Um, I guess your thoughts, Leith, on uh, what's the uh, are you gonna you gonna bet against Australia becoming lucky uh, one more time? Well, it, 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 look, mate, it's probably the widow maker trade, to be honest with you. 
Um, something always seems to come back and you know strike us with a bit of lightning. Yeah. Um, but uh, by look, a rainbow. That's it. Yeah, that's yeah. it. That's it. I didn't want to you know uh, drop drop a drop a bad word, but um, yeah. yeah, yeah. Basically, look, look. You know, who knows? Like the st structurally, I think we we do we, we do do a lot of things wrong. So we, we've basically you know somehow engineered us to have one of the most expensive energy markets, at least on the east coast in the world which then makes our manufacturing uncompetitive and then embeds inflation, et cetera, which is just silly. Yeah. Uh, we do well, that. We with, then... with the with the added point there that we are the largest, well, one of the top three producers of gas in the world. We've yeah, we're, 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 mate, we are an energy superpower. Yes. So we, so, so we could easily have, you know, that as a competitive advantage in this country. Mm. Instead, we make it a disadvantage, which is just bonkers. And, and, and I'd also argue that we dilute our, you know, natural well, wealth. When you, with, and when you say disadvantage, it's a disadvantage to... Australian manufacturers and Australian consumers and and all that. It's a it's an advantage to the foreign to the companies o that own all the to the, the cartel. Assets. Yeah, anyone That's in the it. cartel, it's an advantage. Yes. So. Yeah, yeah. So 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 look, we, look, we do we do try and shoot ourselves in the foot, hmm. but at the same time, we obviously have enormous you know mineral wealth, etc., and and natural wealth spread amongst still uh, you know fairly small share of people. Uh, it does what, what I do wonder those in the longer run, if 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 uh, you know exporting fossil fuels, etc., does become um, you know a thing of the past, well then what does Australia do? Uh, you know, but that 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 that's more a very longer term perspective. Yeah. Um, you know, look, I, I think we'll probably just muddle through like we always do. Uh, we'll get a bit of luck. Um, but the thing that I care about more is, you know, is is the everyday Australians living standards going up? And I don't think they really have improved much in the last 20 years. And I think in a lot of ways, things have gotten worse. I can sort of see that, you know, gradual degradation of living standards continuing uh, yeah. under the sort of policy, set, policy settings that we have. Yeah. Well, and, and that, that would say to me, though, that's a, that's a recipe for, for more uh, political... Um, discontent. Discontent. And, and you know, the, I, I, I've said on here many times before, but, you know, I do think the rise of Trump is, is, large, or is, is in, in a large way part from people who... Are doing really poorly and getting you know median wages going backwards for decades um being told that hey you've never had it so good and they're feeling like maybe that doesn't feel that way and and i think there's yeah that's it leaves you open to demagogues because if if we've got politicians standing up talking about how great our economy is while we've got you know mired in a per capita recession then um you know, somebody who actually turns around and tells people well no you don't have it very good um yeah is uh can can then yeah, end up as, as Trumpian type figures. Yeah, and and I think I think you know one one area where where things are going to come you know, could potentially come a cropper is you know obviously the housing market. So we've got obscenely expensive house prices. We've got a rental crisis, and I think the the we we now are getting to a stage where we have enough people in the rental market to actually uh, cause headaches for the politicians. And mm -hmm. we're seeing the Greens trying to sort of take advantage of that. Unfortunately, they're also arguing for more immigration as well, which which, which undermines their whole argument. Yeah. But you know, um, so you know, I, I, I think renters have been ignored probably for too long, and 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 that's going to start becoming a, a pinch point as well. Yeah, well, I mean, here's my here's my policy suggestion for you, Leith, and I, I'd like to see you pick a hole. I'd like, yeah, it'd be interesting to see what you, what you think where the holes are. I've, I've kicked around with Dave a few times, but the idea is basically saying, look, do we just need a a a housing authority whose whose mission it is to get rents, whatever it is, you know, rent on a two bedroom. The median two-bedroom house below X percent of whatever the, the minimum wage is, and um, their job is just to go out and build shit until <laughs> and build stuff and rent it until, uh, or, or sorry, hire other people to build it and rent it until uh, until we get there. Yeah, I, it I, seems I, obvious that we're not going to be able to get actual house prices down, but maybe targeting rents is, is a better solution. Yeah, look, to be honest with you, I actually don't have a problem with that. The, the, the only the only thing is, like, so for example, I actually don't mind the Greens policy that much. Um, you know, there's a lot of good points. The problem is they then want to increase the immigration intake even more, which is just sort of makes the whole thing, you know, um, self-defeating. Hmm. But, you know, you can do both. You can slow the migration intake down to historical levels, about 120 a year, 100 a year, round, round about that, which is which served us fine until 2005, and then suddenly it was no longer enough. Hmm. Uh, and then, but then do all those sorts of things as well, and you'd solve the problem. So, yeah, you know, I mean, um, and if you're building 300, 400,000 houses a year and new cities and all that type of stuff, then then we could handle 700,000 people coming in, couldn't we? <laughs> I guess it's a it's more yeah, of a question well, of I'm, saying, is that the economy you want? Where you just you 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 we're going to have an economy that builds stuff so that more people can come here, so that we build stuff so that more people can come here in it. 
It sounds yeah, a bit I- like uh, the Chinese economy, you know, designed around building building all this stuff uh, for for people to live in cities, and then one day it finishes and and um, uh, yeah, and you're stuck. Yeah, that's right. So, so look, yeah, mate. To be honest with you, I, 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 like I think that's actually got a bit of merit your, your your proposal, and it's kind of you know Singapore does that sort of thing. So yeah, well, I mean, not exactly the same, but they obviously have you know huge public housing stock where you know most Singaporeans rent, mm. and uh, it seems to work quite well. So um, yeah, we we could certainly improve in a lot of areas, mm. um, but I think the first best thing to do is to stop juicing demand so much through extra warm bodies, yeah. uh, and then and then and then take all these other measures first because that can be done very quickly build it first and then let them come rather than let's yeah let yeah let, let, let them come let and then let them come and, and then, then worry about the consequences them. later yeah yeah that's right excellent look thanks a lot leith appreciate you having you on once again um we'll uh, try and make sure it's not as not as long as uh before we before we do the next one before i go i just want to highlight to people so we've, we've spoken a, a bit about direct indexing and we've um uh and discussed it several times on on the show. Uh, so that's something uh, Nucleus is and the MB Fund is a uh, is a pioneer of. And so direct indexing is very much about taking uh, portfolios. It's basically like taking an ETF, splitting it out, and and adding more of what you want and taking out what you don't want. Uh, there is a conference coming up uh, in the next couple of weeks. So we're in Melbourne on the and so this is sorry this is IMAP. We'll, we'll be a presenter there. So it's it's an. Um, uh, Institute of Managed Account Professionals are running this. And so on uh, Melbourne on the 18th uh, and Sydney on the 21st, there's a post blog post up on our on our website where you can register for that. Uh, we'll send out some emails if you're on our email list as well. Um, but yeah, certainly all welcome to to join that and discuss about the uh, the next generation of, uh, of investing through there. With that said, uh, thanks everyone. We have... Um, uh, we just want to highlight, you know, you can grab our, if you're looking for more Nucleus uh, research uh, or comments, you can you can get us on most uh, social media platforms. Uh, we, you can get this podcast, uh, which is live every Thursday at, at 12.30. Uh, you can get it on YouTube, uh, Spotify, Google Podcasts, all the sort of major and minor uh, platforms. Uh, and if you've got any thoughts or, or comments for guests, feel free to uh, pop us an email or drop it in the uh, drop it in the the, the comments section. Uh, thanks everyone for coming, and we'll see you all next week.